This? Chapter 1 Inch by solid inch, Atley Pine watched the battered coffin being lifted to the surface from where it had rested six feet down for nearly two decades. Coffins and bodies were not supposed to be retrieved. They were supposed to stay right where they were planted, at least until a dying sun lashed out across space and bid farewell to all on Earth. But for Pine, it was just that kind of day. Just that kind of year, actually. She gazed over at a black crow as it stridently cawed from its perch on the branch of a sickly pine overlooking the pierced grave. The bird seemed to think its meal was being delivered up as a boxed lunch, and the creature was getting impatient. Well, I'm 30 years impatient, Pine thought. Pine was an FBI special agent. 5'11 in bare feet, she possessed a muscular build from years of lifting massive amounts of weights, first for athletic glory, and currently to survive the rigorous demands of her occupation. Some agents spent careers mainly on their butts, staring at computer screens or supervising agents on the streets. Pine was not one of them. Her normal beat was in Arizona, near the Grand Canyon. It was a lot of ground to cover, and she was the only FBI agent out there. Pine preferred it that way. She hated bureaucracies and the paper pushers who lived and died by their stifling mountain of rules that got you nowhere fast. Certainly not with putting bad people away, which was really the whole point for her. She was currently in Virginia, working on something personal. This was her one shot to get things right in her life. Next to Pine was her administrative assistant at the bureau, Carol Blum. Pine and Blum were searching for Pine's twin sister, Mercy Pine, who had been abducted from their shared bedroom in Andersonville, Georgia, when the girls were just six years old. Pine had nearly been killed by the abductor, surviving by a combination of sheer luck and, Pine supposed, her absolute unwillingness to die. She hadn't seen Mercy since. It was an incident that had destroyed the Pine family and stood as the one dramatically defining moment of her life. They had tracked Mercy's whereabouts to a place near Crawfordville, Georgia, in Tolliver County, the most rural and least populated county in the state. She had been given the name Rebecca Atkins and had been kept as a prisoner until she'd escaped many years ago. Now the trail was as cold as a morgue freezer. Joe Atkins, one of her captors, had been found murdered the day after Mercy had escaped. His wife, Desiree, had disappeared at the same time. Pine had unearthed that her sister's kidnapper was a man named Ito Vincenzo. He was the brother of Bruno, a mobster who had held a grudge against Pine's mother, Julia. She had acted as a mole for the government in its successful attempts to bring down several New York crime families back in the 1980s. Members of crime families did not like to be brought down. They held it against you. The Vincenzo family had certainly held it against the Pine family. At the urging of his murderous brother, Ido Vincenzo had tried to obliterate the Pines and had largely succeeded. The Bureau had recently put out a PSA, using an image of Mercy captured at the exact moment she had broken free from her improvised prison cell. Pine had hoped that if Mercy was alive, she would see the notice and come forward. That had not happened, so Pine had decided to work on a different lead. Years ago, her mother had told Pine that her father, Tim Pine, had killed himself. Subsequently, she had learned that Tim was not her biological father. A man named Jack Lineberry was. Lineberry had been nearly killed in an attack aimed against Atlee Pine in an unrelated case. The revelation that he was her father had stunned Pine. But what she had found out recently had shocked her just as much, if not even more. That was why she was here. I know all families are dysfunctional, but mine seems to be the undisputed world champ in that competition. The coffin finally reached the surface and was shifted away from the hole and set on the grass. Its metal carcass was visibly damaged by water and also by sitting in the earth all those years. She wondered how preserved the contents would be. A forensics team hurried forward, quickly prized open the coffin, 
and placed the human remains in a body bag. They zipped it up and loaded it into the back of a black van, which was quickly driven away. Pine thought she knew who was in that grave, but thoughts weren't enough. Certainly not for an FBI agent or a grieving daughter, hence the exhumation. DNA identification was as definite as it got. That would reveal who had been in the coffin. Of that, she was certain. Pine had never been to this grave in rural Virginia, for the simple reason that her mother had lied to her about where her father's supposed suicide had taken place. Her mother had also told her that her father had been cremated and his ashes scattered by her at some unknown place. All lies. But then again, it seemed everyone had lied to her about her past. She now believed the man in the grave was none other than Ido Vincenzo. He had apparently discovered Tim Pine's whereabouts and come to exact revenge on him. Only he had ended up being the one to die. Pine had also been led to believe that her parents had divorced because of irreconcilable differences related to their guilt over Mercy's disappearance. Now she knew that Tim had faked his death and her mother had voluntarily left her remaining daughter shortly thereafter. Julia Pine had in fact joined her ex-husband, and they had vanished together, and left me all by my lonesome. Thanks, guys. What great parents you turned out to be. Chapter Two Pine looked at Carol Blum, in her 60s, a mother of six grown children, and a longtime employee of the Bureau. Blum had become something of a surrogate mother to the federal agent, to some degree taking the place of the one who had abandoned her. Blum stared resolutely at her boss, who had her hands shoved deep into her jeans pockets, and whose features held a frown that seemed to run out of room on her face. How soon will they know if it is Ido Vincenzo? Asked Blum. Hopefully a couple of days, Max. I gave them samples of his DNA. How'd you get those? From his son's and grandson's bodies. A familial match under these circumstances constitutes a slam dunk. Yes, of course, Blum said quickly. There's no other way a DNA connection to the Vincenzo family could be in that grave. They walked back to the car and drove off. So what now? Asked Blum. We have some time, since the Bureau has given us an official leave of absence. It was the least they could do after you and Agent Puller solved that case in New York. John Puller was an army investigator who had teamed with Pine to run to ground a blackmail operation that had reached into the highest levels of the country's power structure. Puller had been shot in the process, but he was on his way to a full recovery. You were in on all that too, Carol, and you almost lost your life because I screwed up. You also saved my life. After needlessly putting it in danger, countered Pine. As she turned out of the cemetery, she added, if Mercy sees the PSA, she might come in. That would be the ideal scenario. And if she doesn't, then it could be that she's no longer alive. Pine shot a glance at Blum. I've accepted that possibility, Carol, a long time ago. I know Mercy was alive when she got free from the Atkinses, but a lot could have happened in between, Blum said and it doesn't seem like the Atkinses did anything to, well, to educate her or. Her voice trailed off and she looked uncertainly at her boss. Let's just acknowledge it. She looked like a wild person, said Pine slowly. And I'm not sure how she could manage to function in society on her own, at least mainstream society. And people who live on the fringes with no support can be exploited. Pine looked out the window and said dully, the person I saw in that video could be exploited. But she was resilient and resourceful, Agent Pine. Look at how she survived the Atkinses and then outsmarted them and escaped. And Joe Atkins ended up dead with a knife sticking in his back, replied Pine. I already told you how I feel about that. He deserved what he got. I'm not disagreeing with you, Carol. But I am saying that if Mercy did kill him, if she is violent, then the intervening years might not have been kind to her. She might have done other things. You're thinking that she could have hurt other people? Or more likely, 
had been a victim of violence, Pine said. Which brings me back to my original question. What do we do now? Her last sighting was near Crawfordville, Georgia. She got away that night, or at least it appeared she did. What do you mean, appeared? Asked Blum. Desiree Atkins has never been found. There are at least three scenarios that I can see. Pine counted them off on her fingers. She killed her husband and fled. Mercy killed her and fled. Or Desiree killed Mercy and fled. Why would Desiree kill her husband? By all accounts, she was a sadistic nut. We heard a gunshot on the video and just assumed it was Joe firing at Mercy. But what if Desiree had the gun and was doing the shooting? What if Joe tried to stop her? He gets the gun away, but she stabs him. So you think Joe might have wanted Mercy to get away? I just don't see that. When the truth came out, they both would have been in a great deal of trouble. I'm saying it's possible, not probable. She might have managed to kill Mercy. Then Joe got nervous and wanted to call the police. So she stabbed him and fled with Mercy's body. Only it would have been a real chore for her to lift the body into Joe's truck. Desiree was tiny, and Mercy looked to be over six feet and probably outweighed her by 70 pounds. And they brought cadaver dogs in after we found out what happened there. There are no bodies buried anywhere in that area, so that option is out. But what if Joe helped her get rid of Mercy's body, then got cold feet or regrets? Then Desiree plunged the knife in his back. Blum mulled over this. Or, like you said, Mercy could have killed both of them. She left Joe's body and maybe took Desiree's remains and buried them somewhere far away. It's possible, but that would mean Mercy would have had to drive the truck. Blum said, surely she could have figured that out. Pine shook her head. The truck has a manual transmission. I don't know anybody, particularly someone who has been kept in a hellhole for years and never attempted to drive anything, who could have figured out how a clutch works. Certainly not under such stressful conditions. And I can't see the Atkinses having taught her. So what are you saying then? I'm saying, Carol, that I think it was Desiree who took off that night in the truck. But I think she went alone. Because the jig was up, you mean? Pine nodded. Yes. So to answer your initial question of what to do now, I think we head back to Georgia and see if we can pick up a very, very cold trail. And Jack Lineberry, will you stop in to see him while we're in Georgia? To that, Pine said nothing. She had mixed feelings about her biological father, and their last encounter had been disastrous. She was not expecting anything better the second time around. But ultimately, the fault lay with him, not her. That's just what happened when every word out of your mouth was a lie. Chapter three. Pine stared out the window of the rental car at Crawfordville in densely wooded Tolliver County, Georgia. Here, you'd never see an assailant coming before it was too late. Thick foliage was a killer's best friend, whether they were hunting deer or people. They had flown into Atlanta from Virginia, rented the car and driven here. They had already checked in with Dick Roberts. He was the retired, strayed as an arrow county sheriff who had helped them when they were down here the first time. It had been Roberts who years before had answered the 911 call and found Joe Atkins's body. The question had always been, who'd stuck the knife blade there? Roberts also had been with Pine when they had discovered Mercy's old prison cut into a knoll some distance away from the Atkins's house, and when they had found and viewed the video chronicling her sister's escape. Roberts knew that Mercy was Pine's sister, and that this case was personal to her. No, it's not just personal. I'm betting my entire professional life on finally solving this thing. There is no going back for me. A sense of panic seized her for a moment, like a swimmer who realized they were caught in a riptide with a limited and risky way back to shore. Then she glanced out the window, drew a long, calming breath, and silently chastised herself to get a grip that she was acting like a child. Roberts had given them the route that the Atkins's truck had to have taken that night to where it was later found. 
They were now retracing that route. It was along a rural road. All the roads here were rural and winding, and devoid for the most part of living things, except for the critters residing in the woods. They counted only five homes along the way. Three of them were occupied, two were abandoned. They stopped and asked their questions, and found out that none of the people living here now were there during the relevant time period. After the last interview, Pine and Blum drove to the spot where the truck had been found. It was an old Esso gas station long since abandoned, with the four letters and the neon tubes backing them, having been used for target practice over the intervening years. Only the sign's metal spines survived. It was a bare, eroded filament of civilization in a forest that looked determined to reclaim its own. They sat in the car next to where the gas pumps used to be. Pine took a look around, and the view was as desolate as her hopes. But then, something occurred to her. Okay, the truck and Desiree ended up here, said Pine. But why here? Blum gazed around. I think this is a place to meet someone. Hey, so-and-so, come get me at the Esso station. It was probably the only such landmark around. Desiree didn't know when the body would be found. She wanted to get away, but not in a vehicle that could be traced. And the so-and-sos are pretty limited. In fact, there are only two possible choices to my mind. Len and Wanda Atkins, her in-laws, replied Blum. But Sheriff Roberts said that he talked to them after Joe was killed and Desiree disappeared. They both said they hadn't heard from Desiree. And they were both probably lying to save their own asses. You saw the picture of Mercy with them. They knew she was being held against her will. They knew if this all came out, they were going to prison. That's why they got the hell out of here pretty soon after Mercy escaped and Joe was killed. I'm now certain that Desiree called them that night and told them what had happened. They arranged to meet her here where she abandoned the truck. They drove her somewhere, maybe a bus or train station. And off she went to start a new life with a new identity. Then they went back to their trailer and were there when they got the word the next day about their son. She eyed Blum. Any of that seem unlikely to you? No, it all sounds spot on, Agent Pine. Then Pine's eyes narrowed, and her look became less certain. But it does seem unlikely that they would just take Desiree's word for it that he was dead. They might have thought they could still save him, or that she was even lying about it. But if he was dead, they would have been terrified that animals could have torn Joe's remains apart overnight. And we know that didn't happen. So maybe they were the ones to make sure their son's body wasn't desecrated? Which means we need to find Len and Wanda Atkins and ask them that directly. If they're still alive. If they are, they would be getting Social Security and Medicare. We could find them that way. And he was a Vietnam vet. He was wounded, so... Pine picked up this thought thread. That means he might be in contact with the VA for meds and treatments and the like. That would actually be faster for us than going through the HHS bureaucracy, because I don't really have good contacts there. She pulled out her phone. Who are you calling? Asked Blum. Who else? John Puller. He already helped me get Len Atkins' military records. She spoke with Puller, who told her he was recovering quickly from his injuries. He also said he knew several people at the VA because of his father being in one of their facilities, and he would do all he could to help her locate Len Atkins. She thanked him and clicked off. Okay, we'll let him work his magic. While he's doing that, do you think you should go and visit Jack Lineberry? Pine's expression hardened, and she glanced out the car window. Lineberry's image swelled up in her head like a nightmare. You asked me that before. And you never answered me, which is why I'm asking again. Why should I go see him? Asked Pine, her tone heated. Like it or not, he is your biological father. And the way you left it with him? Look, I'm not proud of what I did. And now it's time to move on to another level with him. Pine glanced sharply at her friend. And why do I have to do that? Because you're going to need his help, whether you find your sister or not. Pine looked even more confused. Come again? 
I presume you still want to find your mother. And Tim Pine, now that you almost certainly know he wasn't in that grave. And Jack can be a valuable asset in helping you do that. However, I'm not asking you to cut him any slack. Good, because I don't intend to, interjected Pine. But, continued Blum imperturbably, I think he is trying his best to do the right thing. And he is your father. And if you don't at least make an effort to have a relationship with him, I think you're going to regret it later. I regret a lot of things, Carol, said Pine. But she put the car in gear and headed on to see the man who had lied to her more than any other person in her life. Except for my damn mother. Chapter Four Jack Lineberry's estate was an hour south of Atlanta. He had made an enormous fortune in the financial world and owned, in addition to this main residence, a penthouse in Atlanta, a pied-a-terre in New York, as well as a private jet. It was a lifestyle that most people would be thrilled to enjoy. Pine was not among them. If you need that many toys to enjoy life, then you're still a child. They had already called ahead and arranged to meet with him. They checked in at the front gate, were admitted into the house, and escorted to Lineberry by one of the maids. He was still in bed, the woman told them, which alarmed Pine because it was well into the afternoon. They entered the room and the maid left. The space was dark and overly warm, with all the window shades lowered. It was like a tomb with wallpaper and carpet and living people. The effect unnerved Pine. Jack, said Pine. Something stirred on the bed. A pajama-clad Lineberry struggled to sit up and finally managed to do so. Pine and Blum drew nearer and looked down at him. Their features betrayed their alarm at the state of the man. He looked like he had aged two decades since the last time they had seen him. A tall, handsome man in his 60s. He looked shrunken, withered, fragile, and most tellingly, done with life. Blum said, Jack, what happened? He focused on her with a pair of weary, bloodshot eyes, his brow crinkling in annoyance, approaching anger. Nothing happened. I'm doing okay. You don't look okay, Pine said bluntly. You don't look okay at all. That's your opinion he replied testily. That would be any reasonable person's opinion, countered Pine. I was shot, Atley. It's not like I have a case of the flu. Nobody just pops back from that, particularly not someone my age. I realize that, she began before glancing at Blum. And I know I was mad beyond all reason after my last visit here. You had every right to be as angry as you were. I feel like I got off easy, actually. Don't go all chivalrous and make this harder than it has to be, she said in a lighter tone. He held up his hand before she could go on. I've been doing a lot of thinking, Adley. At this time in my life, it's imperative to do so. Thinking about what, she said sharply, not liking his fatalistic tone. About you, about Mercy, about your mother and Tim, and finally about me. Pine drew up a chair next to the bed and sat down. And what have you concluded? Part of her didn't want to know his answer. But in life, you needed to listen to things you didn't want to hear. Maybe those most of all. Well, first of all, I'm leaving everything I have to you and Mercy. Pine immediately shook her head, recoiling at this news. Jack, I don't- Please, hear me out. Please. It's important. Pine shot Blum another glance, and the woman nodded with a pleading look on her face. She sat back, folded her arms over her chest, assumed a stubborn expression, and said, Okay, I'm listening, but that's not the same as agreeing. I am your and Mercy's father. That gives me certain responsibilities, none of which I have lived up to. You didn't know where, he interrupted. I knew more than I let on, and what I didn't know I could have found out. The bottom line is, I have behaved abominably throughout this entire thing. 
I doubt any man could have been a worse father. He was so distressed that Pine felt her anger at him start to fade. She sat forward and laid a hand on his arm. Jack, you were between a rock and a hard place. There was nothing simple about the situation. Well, it's simple for me now. I have two daughters. You are my only family. Parents often leave what they have to their children, and that's what I'm going to do, too. If you don't want it, that's fine. Give it away to whoever and whatever you like. But you can't stop me from doing it. He added sharply. I've already had my lawyers draw it all up, and it's signed. There's nothing you can do about that. Okay, Jack. If that's what you want. It is. But you've got a lot of years ahead of you, so this is sort of premature. No one knows what tomorrow will bring, Adley. We both know that better than most. Before she could say anything, he asked. Have you found out more about Mercy or your mother and Tim? Pine told him about the grave being exhumed and awaiting confirmation that the body there was indeed Ido Vincenzo's. She informed him of their steps to track Desiree Atkins that night and their deduction that she had met Len and Wanda and they had helped her to flee. You mean the people who were in that photograph with Mercy? Said Lineberry. Yes. Do you really think you can find them after all this time? With the technology and databases available today, it's hard to stay hidden. And you're hoping they can tell you what happened to Desiree? That's right. And if we can find Desiree, she might be able to shed some light on that night, and even on where Mercy might have gone. She might not have any incentive to tell you, Lineberry pointed out. There are ways she can be persuaded. She's looking at prison time for what she did. And if she murdered her husband or... Pine drew a quick breath. She'll talk. Lineberry, with an effort, sat up a little straighter. The conversation seemed to have animated him. There's one more thing, he said. Pine looked at him warily. Her real father had already thrown one curveball at her with the inheritance thing. She had no interest in another one. Yes? I know that you've been doing all of this searching on your dime. Pine's brow furrowed. She hadn't been expecting this. So? It's not fair that you continue to do so. I have the resources that- She got his meaning. No, Jack. This is my search for- It's mine, too. He snapped. So unexpectedly, they all simply froze. Lineberry actually looked stunned that he had the energy to do it. He continued more calmly. If you use some of my resources, you might get to the truth faster. For instance, the use of my jet to get around. Pine began to shake her head, but Blum said, Go on, Jack. We're listening. She gave Blum a glare, but remained silent. And I know you've been using rental cars and the like. That is not necessary. Take the Porsche SUV. It's just sitting in the garage doing nothing. And, and I've opened an account with funds in it that you have the authority to access from anywhere. He slid open the drawer on his nightstand and took out two pieces of plastic. One debit, one credit. There is no limit on the amount you can charge. The four-digit pin for the debit card is your birthday, month, and day. Jack, I can't take your money. It's not my money, Adley. It's our money. And it's not like you're going to be using it to go on vacation. You're using it to find your sister and my daughter, and your mother and Tim. I presume that when you're working as an FBI agent, the more resources you have to accomplish the job, the better. Am I wrong? Well, no, she said slowly. Then I don't see what the damn problem is, do you? He added bluntly, as though daring her to conjure a reason that would thwart his will. Well, thought Pine, he had niftily turned the tables on her this time. She even felt a grudging pride for how he was handling this. Meanwhile, Blum reached out and took the cards. There is no problem, Jack. Your very generous offer of help is much appreciated. Isn't that right, Agent Pine? Pine looked at her, and then at Lineberry's weary yet hopeful features, and her expression softened. 
Thank you, Jack. That is very kind and very helpful. He sat back, obviously relieved. Blum handed the cards to Pine, who put them in her pocket. Lineberry said, And if you won't stay here, I would like you to use my place in Atlanta as a base. And you can fly in and out of there if need be on my jet. I'll ensure that it's ready to go at all times. I certainly won't be using it for a while. Okay, Jack, said Pine. She glanced at Blum. That will be fine. But we may not be staying there much. We need to go where the leads take us. Understood, he said quickly. But I don't want people waiting hand and foot on us. We can take care of ourselves. I thought you might say that, so I have already given the staff their three months fully paid leave. You'll have the run of the place all on your own. That is very generous, said Blum. It's only fair, said Lineberry emphatically. For everybody. Pine asked. Is there anything you can remember that might provide a lead as to where my mother and Tim could have gone? Lineberry gazed solemnly at Pine. In answer to that, I'm going to give you something that your mother asked me never to let you see. Pine sat up straight now, every muscle tensed, her adrenaline spiking to such a degree she found it difficult to form her one-word response. What? He once more reached into the drawer and this time pulled out a gray envelope. When you read this, I want you to keep in mind that you must do the exact opposite of what your mother writes in here. When did she send it to you? said Pine, ignoring this curious piece of advice. It was around the time she left you. It just turned up in my office mail one day. I had given Tim my contact information when I saw him in Virginia. The letter has no return address, but you can see that the postmark is Charleston, South Carolina. I think she might have been on her way to meet up with Tim when she sent it to me from there. He held out the envelope to Pine. She stared at it like it was a gun being pointed at her. Then she took it, albeit grudgingly. She looked at the handwriting on the envelope. It was clearly her mother's. I, I think I'll read this later. Pine said in a hushed tone. In a shaky voice, Lineberry said, I should have given it to you before now. There really is no excuse, except that for a large part of my adult life, I was steeped in the art of keeping secrets. It's not an excuse, you understand. It's just reality. At least it was for me. Does this give any indication of where they might have gone? Asked Pine. Not that I could find. What did you mean when you said I should do the exact opposite of what she writes? Now that will be clear when you read it, said Lineberry. Chapter 5 Pine drove the Porsche while Blum piloted the rental to the drop-off location at the airport. After that, they headed to Lineberry's penthouse apartment in downtown Atlanta. Pine had been there before to have a drink with Lineberry, but it was the first visit for Blum. Oh my God, said Blum, when the private elevator opened directly into the penthouse suite's vestibule. This is something right out of a dream. Yeah, I know, said Pine glumly. Blum eyed her. Oh, come on, Agent Pine. This is a lot better than the motel we stayed at last time. The heat didn't work and the shower ran at a trickle. He let us use his place in New York. Now we're driving his Porsche and staying here. And we have the use of his private jet. And he wants to leave me all this money and... Yes, I really do feel sorry for you having to face all that, Blum said, with a look that made Pine feel about an inch tall. Pine sighed. I know, I know, Carol. Most people would feel like they'd won the lottery. But you're not most people, said Blum, growing serious. I don't care about stuff like that. I never have. My apartment back in Shattered Rock is perfect. I've got my really cool vintage Mustang convertible. It's all I need. I'm not a private jet sort of gal. That's fine. But let's just use what Jack has offered in order to get where we need to go as fast as possible, like he said. Right, okay. Blum looked at her watch. 
it's dinner time. With the staff on leave. Should I head to what I'm sure is a fabulous kitchen and whip something up? I bet the fridge and freezer are fully stocked. Pine took the credit card out of her pocket. Or how about I treat you to dinner instead? Or at least Jack can. The building concierge gave them several recommendations, and they decided on a French bistro within walking distance of their building. They ordered a bottle of wine and their meals and spent two hours at a table in the back, mostly talking about innocuous things. It felt refreshing to pine, but she also felt some remorse. Pretty much every waking moment lately had been devoted to finding her sister. Deviating from that, even for a little bit, felt like a betrayal of mercy. We are making progress, Agent Pine, but we do need to take a break every now and then, said Blum, apparently reading Pine's thoughts. Pine nodded and then glanced around the restaurant, eyeing people who she was sure had their own share of problems. Maybe not as dire as hers, yet problems still. But she was afraid, despite the progress Blum had mentioned, that either her problem would never have a resolution, or the conclusion would be finding her sister's body. Can you handle that, Lee? You told yourself you could, but were you lying? They were walking back when Blum said, will you read the letter tonight? Pine nodded. Yes, I have to, although part of me is dreading it. I can understand that, although there might be some clue in there. Maybe, Pine said doubtfully. Back in the apartment, Pine took a long, steaming hot shower, put on a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt, and climbed into bed. She took the letter out and stared at the envelope for a little while. With her finger, she traced her mother's lovely cursive handwriting, which was quite familiar to her. Pine sat back against the pillow, and then abruptly stood, grabbed her phone, left her room, and walked down to the wine cellar that Lineberry had shown her on their previous visit. She snagged a bottle of Italian wine. It was the same vintage that he had served Pine here before. She decided she needed some more alcohol to make it through the reading of her mother's letter. A lot more. She went out onto the terrace that wrapped itself around three sides of the penthouse. There was a glass wall rising nearly chest high enclosing the space. All weather wicker furnishings and exquisite plantings and fountains and a large fire pit surrounded her. It really was a paradise, and she felt enormous guilt. I wonder where Mercy is right now. I seriously doubt in a place like this. Pine opted to just sit on the floor, after using a remote control to ignite a gas fireplace enclosed by stone and textured ceramic tile. She moved closer to the flames and set her phone down, then opened the wine bottle, poured a generous amount into her glass, and took a long sip. Okay, no more stalling, Lee. She would sometimes refer to herself by the name she'd had growing up. She'd been given it because Mercy had trouble pronouncing Atlee and just started calling her Lee. The name had stuck until Pine had gone to college. Now, she would dearly love to hear her sister call her by that name even once. She took out the two-page letter and unfolded it. She frowned when she saw her hand shaking. She took another sip of wine to calm her nerves. It didn't work. Come on, it's just a stupid letter. But clearly it was far more than that. This would be the first example she'd ever seen of what her mother was thinking about things since she had abandoned her daughter all those years ago. Pine finished the glass of wine and poured another. So, here goes, Pine thought, taking a deep breath and holding it like she was about to go underwater for a while. Dear Jack, once again, you have come to the rescue, and Tim and I can't thank you enough. It was terrible, horrible what happened in Virginia. The person obviously wanted to either hurt me by killing Tim, or thought I might be there with Tim. I am still shaking after almost losing him. Here, Pine almost put the letter down. She had no desire to hear her mother's thoughts on almost losing her husband when she had chosen to walk away from her daughter. But something made her continue. And then came the even harder part, leaving my beloved Lee. 
I can't believe that I'm even writing this, Jack. She is really all I have left. After Mercy was taken, which was entirely my fault, as we both know, Lee was all that kept my life going. I know that I smothered her. At the same time, I put up a wall between us. I felt that if I let myself get too close to her, that I would let something slip that would put her in danger. I couldn't do that to my little girl. Sitting next to her in that hospital bed, not knowing if she was going to live or die, not knowing what had happened to Mercy, my mind just shut down. I couldn't process anything other than the well-deserved guilt I was feeling. When my girls needed me, I wasn't there. There is no more basic duty for a mother, and I failed that duty miserably. She has now grown into a very smart, accomplished young woman I'm so proud of, and she did it all on her own. I know that she sees how I have shut her out, and this just deepens my guilt. To withhold love from someone you love more than life itself, it does something to you, Jack, something irreversibly painful. But I can't make myself change course now. I just can't. The truth is, if Lee thinks I don't love her, then she won't miss me when I'm gone. At least that's my hope. Now, I have come into some money. I won't tell you exactly how, but I figured out something, and when I confronted the person, I turned out to be right. This money will fund Lee's college and also help provide for her later in life, and also give Tim and me something to live on. It is with a heavy heart that I am leaving her, but I feel very confident that she will be safe now. When you recruited me all those years ago, I was younger than Lee is now. I was scared to death. I didn't want to do it, but you showed me how much good would come of it. And I suppose it has, for others, but not for the Pine family. I fully accepted that. Tim did as well. But not Mercy and Lee. They had no choice. All I know is even though Tim and I will be together, I will be more alone than I ever have been before. Without my daughters, I am nothing. I thought that I had sacrificed everything for them. In the end, I simply sacrificed them. No mother could have done any worse than I did. So much so that I don't deserve to even be called one. Not anymore. I think of Mercy and Lee every day, and I will until the day I die. They were both my little flowers that I let wither. But I will spend the rest of my life trying to make up for what I did, for the poor choices that I made. At least I can try. Thank you for everything, Jack. If you ever see Lee, please don't mention me to her. Don't say anything that will dredge up memories she should just forget. I'm not worth the trouble. She just needs to get on with her life and never look back. And then she had signed the letter with her real name, Amanda, as opposed to Julia. The tears that had fallen from Pine's eyes had stained the pages in several places. She read it through three more times, clinging to different words and phrases with each pass. She finally folded the pages and set them next to her as she watched night fall over the lighted Atlanta skyline. Her family was out there somewhere, but the reality was all three of them could be dead now. If so, would finding their graves, if there even were graves, be enough for her? I don't know the answer to that. I can't possibly. Her phone dinged. She looked at the screen. It was a text from John Puller. She sat up straighter. Leonard Atkins was receiving aid from the VA, and it was going to an address in Huntsville, Alabama, that Puller had also provided in the text. Pine googled the location. It was about three and a half hours by car from Atlanta. She went back inside and climbed into bed. Her last thought before she fell asleep was, just keep plugging, Atley, every day, and you'll eventually get there. You'll find them one way or another.
Chapter 6 When the woman rose from the chipped wooden stool, she stood a statuesque six foot one in her long, bare feet. She flexed her right hand and then her left. The fingers were calloused and strong, just like all the rest of her. She felt pops, twinges and creaks, as bones and cartilage resettled into appropriate grooves. More cantankerous elements refused to fully reset, but grudgingly moved a bit closer to normal. She stretched her long, muscled neck, rolling it one way and then the other. She pushed her sculpted shoulders away from her neck, and her ripped traps and delts thanked her as the release of tension was both palpable and immediate. She wore a frayed black sports top with a faded Nike swoosh, and a chest protector under that along with a pair of faded black Lycra athletic shorts. Both pieces of compression clothing sharply defined her long, muscular, and scarred physique. The short, trim man standing next to her helped the woman slip on her gloves, and then he commenced rapidly massaging her long, ropey arms. You ready? He asked, looking up at her. She glanced down at him with a frown. I'm here, Jerry. So what the hell do you think? He put in her mouth guard and then made the sign of the cross. He always did that, and it always irritated the crap out of her. Who are you trying to signal, dude? You're looky? She muttered through the mouth guard. See you on the other side, Elle, said Jerry as he hurriedly left the ring. Eloise L. Kane was getting a bit long in the tooth for what she was about to do though she did it only when she really needed the money. Her opponent tonight was four inches shorter, but a real stud. At 190 pounds, she outweighed the taller Kane by 10 pounds. And, like Kane, almost all of it was bone, gristle, and muscle displayed across her broad shoulders, sinewy core, abs like rows of stacked bricks, barrel-thick thighs, muscled glutes, and diamond hard calves. She could destroy 99% of the guys out there and give the other 1% a run for their money. Her technique was rock solid. She could fight all day, could absorb terrific punishment, and had crushing power in all four limbs. She was over a dozen years younger than Kane, and many thought she had a shot at the big time. The only question marks were her fighting smarts and mental toughness, and the fact that the women's UFC world topped out at featherweight or a 145-pound limit. Kane had always thought that was sexist bullshit. There were some women out there who could fight with the best of them. The men had heavier weight divisions in the UFC, so why were the bigger women ruled out? Maybe they would just have to start their own league, or the larger women would have to make the jump to boxing, with its far heavier weight divisions. But ultimately, it wasn't fair. And like always, the women got the short end of the athletic stick. Kane believed. Her opponent had more tats than unmarked skin, Kane observed. The general theme of the skin art seemed to be violent death, with sadomasochistic torture running a close second. Kane knew she was here just for the woman to notch a win on her career belt as she moved up in the land of mixed martial arts. Well, maybe I have different plans. This was decidedly not the big time. No cage match televised on pay-per-view happening here. No Ronda Rousey, Holly Holm, or Chris Cyborg within a thousand miles of this dive. No million-dollar payoffs or eye-popping commercial endorsements. This was small-time, local stuff. But the rowdy, hard-drinking crowd numbered well over 200, and the excitement of what they were about to witness was palpable. The site was an old factory where stuff used to be made by the locals, until the world changed and the country stopped making any stuff at all. Now it was a tin pot relic that was used for myriad purposes, none of them authorized, and some of them patently illegal. But who was going to deny folks a little fun and a way to make some money on the side? And I can earn my little pot of gold tonight. The official purse was five grand. If she won, Kane would get only a thousand of it. The loser got 300 bucks flat for getting her brain scrambled. Just how it was at this level. What Kane called it was kicking the shit out of someone while they kicked the shit out of you, while the crowd guzzled beer and sucked in weed, cheering and jeering. 
The rest of the cash would go to assorted males on the food chain, who added no value and took no risks and raised not one finger. But they had power and influence behind them, so they got their pound of flesh. Yet the possibility of a thousand bucks for one night's work was more than enough incentive for Kane to be standing where she was, mouthpiece in, fists gloved, strategy mapped out, adrenaline spiking. The women met in the middle of an improvised ring, where fence posts had been cemented into huge tractor trailer rims to hold them upright. The chain link fence around the ladies was eight feet high with a padlocked gate. Unlike a UFC octagon ring, the chain link was not coated with soft vinyl, and the metal posts had no safety coverings. You got rammed into that, it was not going to feel good. The floor was not springy canvas, just concrete. So ditto for sudden collisions there. But Kane didn't mind. This was a piece of cake compared to other things she'd endured in life. Although the locked cage door always bothered her. But, if need be, she could climb the fence. She glanced at her opponent, who was giving Kane her version of the intimidating dead-eye stare, which differed from the way that men did it. While testosterone-spiked guys always overplayed their hand and abilities in mental confrontations like this, women usually understated how badly they were going to mess you up. In your dreams, buttercup, Kane said. She tacked on a broad smile at the dead eye, which really seemed to piss the gal off. If I get in your head, all the better. The setup was three five-minute rounds, unless one fighter was knocked out or otherwise was no longer able to defend herself. Kane had never been knocked out, but there was always the chance. The lower number of rounds meant that the fight would be high intensity pretty much from the get-go. There was no cruising in this ring of human mayhem. The crowd wanted punishment and blood and lots of it. Like watching the NFL, it was far more American than baseball and apple pie ever would be. The tough and vicious one, and everybody else was a loser. The only people inside this temporary prison where the max sentence was 15 minutes were the fighters and the ref. This one was a stout, arrogant piece of work who had the deserved rep of being a misogynistic creep who was not below feeling up a gal who had been knocked off her feet and or robbed of consciousness. He had tried that on a momentarily dazed cane in one fight, and she had communicated her displeasure by nearly biting off one of his fingers. He had never tried it with her again, but she didn't hold out hope for the jerk to call anything fair her way tonight. But Kane also wasn't overly confident. She had assorted injuries that had never healed properly, including a rotator cuff that had the tendency to seize up on her when she needed it the most. And her opponent wouldn't need much of an advantage to knock Kane right on her ass, lights out. The ref gave his brief instructions, shot a glare in Kane's direction, wiggled his permanently damaged index finger, and the ladies stepped back, awaiting the commencement of the match. It came a few seconds later via air horn, and the fight was on. Chapter 7 The women charged forward and met once more in the middle of the ring, with flared nostrils, cocked and locked limbs, and lethally intent eyes, while the crowd noise revved higher as the old, rusted guts of the factory rose up behind them. The whole scene was bolstered by ear-piercing music. Eye of the Tiger was running on a loop, and someone had set up 70s-era strobe lights, and even a smoke machine that was already starting to peter out. It was tackiness taken to a whole new level, and everyone in attendance apparently loved it, except the two women about to do serious battle. They had other things on their minds, like survival and money. While the volume of the crowd spiked, Kane and her opponent took just a few seconds to feel each other out. Kane threw a jab and a snap kick to gauge the other woman's tendencies, power, skill level, and reaction time. Her opponent did the same. The woman landed a crisp shot to Kane's left oblique. Kane made her retreat by looping a kick in the woman's direction, but she did not stretch her long leg to its maximum range of motion. Kane took a right cross to the chin and a knee to her other oblique. Both blows stung. The chick was faster than Kane was, she had to admit, her muscle twitch superior. 
none of that was unexpected. She could tell that the lady was not maxing out, not yet. She had the fuel to dump Kane on her ass, that was without doubt. Kane feigned short left and then hit her opponent with a right uppercut straight to the gut. But the woman's ab wall was stone, no damage done there, not really. Kane observed a sharp exhale of breath come out of the lady's mouth with the impact, like air from a popped balloon. But the eyes remained clear, and her expression looking more assured of victory. She must have assumed Kane had used max power on that blow. But the arms were your weak limbs. True strength, the real knockout power, Kane well knew, was housed lower. Two rounds passed with hundreds of punches and kicks and knees thrown and painfully landed, and blood and sweat released. And it was a lot of blood and a lot more sweat as their bodies collided, separated, and slammed against each other again and again like grizzly bears ripping at each other. The concrete floor quickly became littered with the droplets of both women's blood and sweat, which their constantly moving bare feet had fashioned into blurry, ill-defined patterns that looked like an early stage Jackson Pollock masterpiece. Welts and purplish bruises covered their arms and legs and torsos. Cuts littered their faces. You didn't do this sort of thing if your looks really mattered to you. A forearm to the nose or a foot to the chin was going to land you on the floor, not a magazine cover. In a brief clinch, Kane said tauntingly through her mouth guard, Come on, kid. You're supposed to be the next big thing. You haven't even knocked me down once, cream puff. The angry woman tried to armbar her, but Kane roughly shoved her off and got a snarl in return. Her opponent leapt forward and Kane took a hard shot to the head. She fell back a bit, but not in a defenseless way that would encourage the woman to immediately charge after her, hoping to land blow after frenetic blow until the ref stepped in and ended it. And this ref would do that in a heartbeat against Kane, just to deprive her of the cash. Not tonight, jerk off. But then her rotator seized up, and Kane couldn't lift her arm high enough to guard her face. The pain was etched on her features. The other woman immediately noted all this and came in for the kill. She pounded Kane with everything she had, her fists moving so fast Kane could barely see them, much less block them. A cross caught her on the right side of the face, staggering her. A hook battered the other side of her head. An uppercut tore into her chin and she fell back, trying to keep it together and attempting to unlock her rotator. But then the other woman made one mistake, and that was all it took inside a cage match. The mistake was stepping back and dropping her hands just enough because she thought she was out of Kane's range. She was regaining her breath after her onslaught of blows and taking her time in deciding how best to knock Kane out, which she now assumed was a foregone conclusion. This was what Kane's intentionally shortened range of motion maneuvers had laid the groundwork for all throughout the fight. After a minute or so of jousting, even competitors at this level could mentally measure every millimeter of the ring and tack onto that the exact outer limits of their opponent's reach. But the latter calculation didn't work if the opponent lets you see only what she wanted you to see. And with every kick launched, Kane had methodically done exactly that, never letting the gal see her full range of motion, which really was the whole ball of wax. Now, with her rotator betraying her, the moment had come. The woman's trainer, more adept at this sort of thing than his protege, and having seen Kane fight before, screamed out a warning through the chain link. It was a warning his fighter never heard, because it came a second after Kane slammed her size 13 right foot, hard as a tree branch, into the woman's jaw. Even with all the noise, everyone in the crowd heard the sound, like a watermelon smashing on pavement, as the jawbone gave way to the footbone. The fighter was lifted several inches into the air with the force of the blow, her head snapping back far more rapidly than heads were designed to do. When she came back down, the woman toppled like a chainsawed pine to the cement because her consciousness had just left the building. All the ref had to do was bend down and see that the limp body held not a shred of anything that constituted a fighter capable of continuing. 
He waved the contest over after two minutes and 34 seconds into the final round. More of the crowd groaned in disappointment than screamed in delight. Clearly, the majority of bettors here thought Kane was going to get her ass kicked tonight. The fallen lady was briefly revived with a cracked capsule of ammonia inhalant, hauled to her feet and stood there, almost entirely held up by her pissed off trainer, as the ref grudgingly raised Kane's hand in victory. Then the beaten fighter immediately collapsed and was carried out of the ring on a stretcher. Blood trickling down her face and out of her nose, Kane stalked out of the ring without saying a word to anyone. She had nothing she wanted to say or anyone she wanted to say it to. Kane just wanted her damn money. Chapter eight. In the dingy, filthy bathroom that held no shower, Kane stripped off her sweaty clothes and ran a soapy wet towel over herself to remove the stink and the blood, both hers and her opponents. The bruises on her face were nothing. They would heal. She then briefly eyed her long, naked body in the cracked mirror under the popping, unforgiving glare of fluorescent lights that had been all the rage a half century ago. Only the best for this gal. Not a single tattoo was grafted onto her skin. She didn't need them. She had scars, burn marks, lumps, painfully deep knife cuts and other disfigurements. They were all there, hand tooled into her. She didn't grimace in resentment or disgust as she looked at these old wounds. She smiled in triumph. I survived it all. That had always been her attitude. Throw everything you got at her and she'd still be standing even if you weren't. She especially liked it if you weren't. Kane ran a hand over dark fuzz cut so close to the scalp that it almost looked shaved. She had done that last year. She should have done it long before then. Long hair had made her angry, for as far back as she could remember, which wasn't all the way back. She knew there were holes, gaps, blanks. Once, she had hoped to fill them all in. Now, she appreciated the gaps. She had no more interest in discovering anything about her past, because what would be the point? Only today and tomorrow and the day after that counted. And right now, she was a winner of a thousand bucks. So this was one of her best days in a long time. Kane had finally got her rotator unseized, iced where she'd taken the hardest shots, rubbed ointment on her cuts, and put on her underwear and bra, faded jeans and a tattered sweatshirt. Flip-flops went on her feet, though it was cold outside. With the prize money, she would buy some new casual shoes but 13 double wide wasn't routinely available, at least in something that didn't look like footwear for clowns. She slipped the sleek 15-shot Glock 19 with the black matte finish she always carried to these fights out of a padlocked cabinet and into her belt clip. She stuffed her other things into a small duffel, slung it over her shoulder, and went in search of her winnings. She found it in the form of a small, thin man in a cheap, wrinkled suit, with flint chips for eyes and a mustache that kept twitching like something was living inside it. He was standing in the hallway right off where the fight had taken place. An unlit cigarette dangled from his lips like an afterthought. The crowd was gone. It might just be her and him. And Kane wanted this over as soon as possible. A man, a woman, and money to be given, all in solitary isolation, was always complicated. She held out her hand. Let's have it, Sam, I got an early morning. He lifted a worn envelope from his inside coat pocket and held it up tauntingly. You suckered her pretty good, Elle, but she's smart. She'll figure it out. Unlike you, she's going places. Kane didn't take the bait for the simple fact that she didn't care. Right now, the only place she's going is the hospital for a concussion check and to have her jaw wired. If she's really smart, she'll take a coding class and leave you and this shit behind. She dropped her duffel, grabbed the envelope, and opened it. It's all there, said Sam. You think I'd cheat you? Yeah, I do. Because, yeah, you have. That was before. Before what? She caught him looking at her Glock. Kane said, 
Hallelujah for open carry and no background checks. All a girl needs not to get screwed by jerks like you. Right, he sneered. You have trouble passing a background check, Elle? She finished counting the cash and put it in her duffel. I'd pass it as easy as you would, Sam. You made a few folks a ton of money tonight. Most bet against you. Yeah, well, stupid them. You passed your prime. Maybe if you'd taken it seriously ten years ago. You got a lucky kick in tonight. She would have decisioned you easy, and she almost knocked you out. She was ahead in the first two rounds, and in the third, when your bum's shoulder locked up, she was kicking the shit out of you. She's just better. Admit it. How would you know anything about it, Sam? You've never been in the ring, have you? See, that takes a bunch of things you'll never have. She glanced at his crotch, starting with balls bigger than peanuts. He didn't seem to be listening to Kane. He gave her the once-over. You know, if you fixed yourself up, got all that damn shit on your skin taken care of, wore some decent clothes now and then, didn't shave your scalp like some dopey skinhead, and for a few hours acted like a girl instead of an attack dog, you could be attractive to a guy. You do that, maybe you and me could have some fun. I could be fun with the right gal. He stroked her arm. The next moment he was thrown against the wall with the muzzle of Kane's drawn glock pressed against his cheek. You ever try to lay another hand on me? She racked the gun slide to chamber around and pressed the muzzle so far into his skin it rode up against his cheekbone. You're batshit crazy, bitch, cried out a terrified Sam. And don't ever forget that. Kane stepped back, holstered the glock, grabbed her duffel, and walked off. She signed a few autographs for some stragglers in the parking lot, who were probably too shit-faced to even know who she was. After that, Kane climbed into her dented 1990s-era two-door Honda Civic hatchback, with enough miles on it to have circumnavigated the world nearly ten times. Off and on over the years, this car had also served as her home as she crisscrossed the country. Great old car, thought Kane as she started the engine. What would I do without you? She patted the dash like it was an old friend. And when you didn't have many friends, sometimes a car would do just fine. The drive didn't take long, because Kane lived in a nearby area that had not been gentrified. She supposed there were too many undesirables around, including me. Chapter 9 Kane parked out front and entered through the only door to her place after unlocking the rusted padlock. She relocked it on the other side because folks around here didn't abide by the same laws most human beings did. She knew at some point the owners would kick her and the other residents out and turn this place into something that would make them real money. For now, it was just a series of makeshift pods separated by thin walls having been put up during its transition from commercial use to residential. In that way, the place had been inexpensively reborn from the hulks of semi-attached, dilapidated buildings, where the current residents were one step up from being homeless. But it was a damn important step, she knew. You could always take a home for granted, until you didn't have one. She had a roof, a bed, a toilet, a microwave, enough heat to get by, and windows and a floor fan in lieu of AC. She had a cell phone that she had found by stealing it, and Wi-Fi that she had lifted from a nearby network after learning its password. There were rats all over, but they left her alone for the most part. The dump cost her 400 a month in rent plus utilities, and that was a blessing to her, because she couldn't afford a penny more than that. Her legal name for a long time now was Eloise Kane. Eloise had come from a book she had read as a child. She didn't go by Rebecca Atkins anymore, not since that night in Georgia. And she had had another name before that, but she couldn't remember what it was. How did I get so lucky to have all these names? She sometimes thought, when she'd had too many beers or too much weed, or both. Most people only have the one. And Kane? That just came from reading the good book. Desiree Atkins had said the scriptures were all she needed to know in the way of learning, 
that she had to repent her whole life for all the awful things she'd done and all the awful things she'd wanted to do. Well, she had certainly wanted to do awful things to Desiree, all right. But whatever she was willing to do paled in comparison to what the woman actually had done to Kane. After escaping, Kane had basically lived at some of the best public libraries in the country for years. And it wasn't necessarily about reading and learning, at least not at first. She had found, as a rule, that the more books you read, the longer they let you stay. And when it was freezing cold or mercilessly hot out, that was important. And if you read a lot of books and even helped out, she had found that kindly librarians had often become informal teachers, helping her to read better and to write. And on top of that, they fed her too. Because without something in the belly, the mind didn't work too good. Those years had constituted her formal instruction for better or worse. She really had no clear memory of anything prior to going to live with the Atkinses, except for one thing. But it was a big thing, a really big thing. She dropped her duffel next to the mattress on the floor. A box next to the mattress represented her closet. She could have flicked on a light, but she preferred the dark. Counterintuitively for her, things somehow seemed to have greater clarity in total darkness. The stark distractions of life were filtered out by it, allowing one to fully focus as though one's life depended on it which it often had for Kane. She took a loose board out of the floor and opened the lid of the tin box she kept there. The money went in and the board went back. Also on the floor were stacks of books. All had been taken from libraries, some with permission, most without. But she had read them all, multiple times. So there was that. Books were meant to be read, not displayed on a shelf for decoration. She sat on the mattress and rolled a joint. She lit it, sucked on it, drank in the smoke's fumes as the night deepened and the weed siphoned off some of her pain from the fight. Over the years, she'd torn through all of the hard stuff. Coke, crack, meth, heroin, synthetics, exotic street mixes. Then she'd almost died from an Oxycontin pill laced with fentanyl. It had taken three pops of naloxone spray from an EMT to bring her back, or so she was told. After that, she'd walked away from it. It was a bitch to kick, but she'd kicked harder than that. The bottom line was nothing was going to control her ever again. She focused on the memory from long ago. They don't want you anymore. The man had said that night, to the little girl she used to be with the name and history she no longer remembered. As they sat in his car, he had said, They sent me here to take one of you. Your mother and father told me to kill you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm taking you to another family that wants you. You'll be safe there. She remembered the older couple, Len and Wanda Atkins. That was who the man had taken her to. Then she had been quickly passed on to Joe and Desiree Atkins. What they had done to her? Well, Desiree mostly. She had tried her best to forget, but she never really could. Slave, that was what she was. Slave, prisoner, piece of property, human meat. She had read about that stuff in books. Blacks used to be slaves in this country, she had read. Whatever the term, it was all she was back then. How many trees had she chopped down for firewood? How many logs carried? How much brush cleared? Floors and windows scrubbed, dishes washed, carpet vacuumed, grass cut, garden tended, bushes trimmed, vines and crap cleared, walls painted, clothes laundered, toilets and sinks cleaned, beds made, meals prepared that were never for her. How much shit hauled from one spot to another or do this, do that, now. Orders just because they could make her. She had read the fairy tale about Cinderella. I was her, only I never found a prince. And my feet are way too big for a glass slipper. Human beings were funny, in a very unfunny way. She grew tall, very tall. 
Her parents must have been tall. She couldn't remember. And her life had made her strong. She could lift a truck, and she possessed stamina out the roof, able to work her ass off for days and not feel it. And not an ounce of fat was on her frame, because they fed her just enough to keep her hungry. And her pain tolerance? What she had endured tonight, it was painful, for sure. But really nothing compared to what she had endured in the past. Desiree had really liked to burn shit. Dogs, cats, but mostly Elle. And mentally, she was stronger than she otherwise ever would have been. Every day the same. First, the locked room in the house. Then her final destination was the little prison in the woods. Another fairy tale with a monster attached. The chain, the smell of rotting clay. She'd stayed focused in her mind to survive it, played the mental games required not to lose her sanity. She obsessed over mundane stuff so she could bury the total absurdity of her current existence in the black hole of her mind while she doted over minutiae. The counting of seconds, the drip of water, the arrangement of her rag clothes on her grimy shelves, the cleaning of dishes, the fixation on just where to place the first cut on a tree limb, or the sighting of a fawn that drove her to tears, or the spying of a hawk enjoying the lift of air currents along with the best view in the county. A bird with more freedom than she had. Each day she was alive to see the sun rise and then fall was an enormous victory. It truly was the little things, particularly when all the big things had been denied you. The long days and nights of labor, the knock-knock on the door for her two daily meals, her with the food, him eventually with the gun, because she had grown far bigger than both of them. They were afraid of her. She could see that in their wide eyes, and how Joe clutched the weapon, how the vein at his temple bulged, while that door, that damn door, stayed open. Never seeing another living soul except the scaredy cat Joe and the bug-eyed and vicious Desiree, and occasionally Len and Wanda, who would come with sad eyes and leave with sadder ones. Kane had passed from terrified kid to cool-eyed adult. She was a prisoner, even though she'd never been tried and convicted of anything. Until that day came. The escape, timed just so. She'd distracted him. He'd forgotten about the padlock, failed to secure it after doing exactly that year after year. She smiled at the thought. She knew about the camera. But she'd waited for them to get back to the house, counting off the strides in her head. She knew their routine better than they knew their routine, because they had a whole other life to think about. And she didn't. She just had this. Then she had hit the door with all her strength, and she was so damn strong, like a lion, like a wild ass lion that was about to break out after years in captivity. You humans better run like the living hell, cause something not human is coming for you. The monster in the fairy tale is breaking out tonight, you mothers. And she had slammed into that door again and again and again. And just like that, freedom. She puffed on the joint, sucked in the smoke, and opened the small fridge she'd found in a dumpster and repaired and cleaned up. She pulled out a Budweiser, popped the top, and drank her fill, the beer irritating her busted lip. She pressed the cold can against it and then her oblique. Broken-jawed bitch really packed a wallop. But there she was that night, charging to freedom, not knowing where she was going, not caring about that in the least. After all those years. Then there'd been Joe Atkins, looming up in her field of vision like the big bad boogeyman. Only she was bigger and badder than Joe would ever be. He was a gnat to be squashed. She lifted the beer can until it was upside down and she finished it off, wiped her chin, and pinched the joint out, saving the rest for later. She breathed in the reefer-scented smoke drifting in the air, like lines of miniature cumulus in her room, with the added benefit of making her high. Yes, there had been Joe, 
And then he had been there no more. Squashed. Freedom. She lay back on the mattress, kicked her flip-flops off and wriggled her long toes. She had cash. She had a single credit card that she used very sparingly. She had a place to live, wheels to go to other places. She had jobs that she did, crap that she pulled. Not all legal, but so what? Nothing done to her had been legal. Survival. She fell asleep thinking only of that. Just like pretty much every other night. It didn't make her feel worse, and it didn't make her feel better. But at least it made Cain feel something. Hallelujah. You survived it all, L. Now go to sleep and get ready for tomorrow. Just in case it comes. Chapter 10 Her phone alarm dinged at 6 a.m., and Kane rolled over and yawned. She sat up and opened the window to get out the final dregs of any lingering pot smoke. But she wasn't too worried. While they had random drug testing at her first place of work today, they used a blood test. A blood test could only detect THC, the component in pot that made you feel high, for about three hours after use. A saliva test could do it for between 24 and 72 hours. A urine test could nail you for up to 30 days after use. Hence, many employers used saliva, or more likely a blood test as their testing tool. Otherwise, they'd test their way right out of business, because they'd have no bodies to do the work. That was the dirty little secret of the crap work world, where millions labored every day, and the savviness of addicts who needed a job. She opened her fridge, cracked three eggs into a glass, and drank it down raw. She had seen this done in an old movie about a down-and-out boxer named Rocky. Protein, apparently, which helped your body recover and build. Which was good, Kane thought, because it tasted like shit and had the texture of snot. She changed into the outfit she had fought in, blood, sweat, and all, covered that with a hoodie and sweatpants, and slipped on a pair of worn sneakers. Then she left her place padlocking the door on the other side. She ran for miles, her breath forming visible clouds with every exhale. Winter was coming with speed, but she would be snug in her little place, hopefully. She liked to run, and her long legs and frame were built for eating up massive quantities of ground. Kane had been running her whole life, sometimes for real, other times just in her mind, especially when she'd been locked up all those years. She would jog in place and let her imagination take her to any place other than the one she was in. The things she did in her mind to keep going, it was some wicked shit. Taught her stuff. Demonstrated that your mind could get you through anything. Anything. Because it had done so for her. Psalm of my life. If you can't live in the world you have, make one up. She stopped at five different tents and boxes and handed out cash from her prize money at each one. These were not boozers or druggies, at least not mostly. They would use the money for food and other necessaries because they all had young kids living with them in their distress. Thank you, said one young mom, who was white but looked brown with the sun and the dirt. Kane could relate. This was the tan of homelessness. It was unlike any other skin tanning ever, Kane knew. It fried your brain as well as your outside. It never really came off you, because you worried every minute it could happen again. It was like you were a fugitive for life, and your only crime was bad luck or bad choices. When the rich and powerful made a mistake, their lawyers and PR folks took care of it. Kane waved the woman's thanks off and kept running. The next family was black, the next one after that, too. The next one spoke Spanglish and shivered in the chill. The next family, she couldn't really tell what they were, not that it mattered. They were breathing, they were human, they looked like me in that way. That was enough. Boxes were meant to house stuff, not put people in, not until they're dead, anyway. Most people looked at them and felt either sorry or disgusted, or both. Not Kane. She just saw folks who needed some help. 
At the end, she had given away over half her winnings. She knew what the term Good Samaritan meant, but only because of the Bible reading. But that was not why she was doing it. She did it because today she had money, and today they didn't, but needed it. Keep it simple, was Kane's motto. When you thought too hard about it, you tended to want to keep what you had and dare others to try to take it. She got back to her place and completed her daily workout with push-ups, floor dips, chin-ups on a bar wedged in a doorway, lots of ab and core work with a medicine ball, and exercises with a kettlebell she'd gotten for a buck from a gym going out of business. Then body weight lunges and squats and calisthenics, followed by shadow boxing. She finished with some heavy-duty stretching. The strong and vigilant don't always survive, but it damn sure improves your chances. She showered in cold water, because that was all there was. She had started her period late last night. She had had her first period at age 11, while she was with the Atkinses. She thought she was dying when the cramps came and the blood dripped from down there. She had begged Desiree to help her. The woman had laughed and thrown her a roll of paper towels, telling her that it would come every month like clockwork. She had added, they sell stuff for it, but the paper towels will do for you. It's not like you're going anywhere, so deal with it. And Kane had dealt with it using the paper towels. Until Wanda Atkins had explained to Kane what was really going on and given her boxes of tampons. That had been an eye opener. She remembered asking Wanda if boys had periods too. No, she had said. Good thing, because they couldn't handle it. Kane believed she spoke the literal truth. Wanda had been nice to her, sneaking her books, taking care of some medical needs, bringing her some extra food. But she never once made any effort to free her. There were limits, Kane supposed, to people's generosity and morals. Chapter 11 For 25 hours a week and nine bucks an hour, Kane operated a forklift loading packing crates onto tractor trailers. They wouldn't allow her full time work because that came with benefits and other rights. All the guys there, she was the only female, were also part-timers. She parked her Honda outside the terminal, put on her hard hat and protective shoe coverings and safety goggles, punched the clock, and climbed into her little rig. They could have gotten plenty of guys with heavy equipment operating licenses to do this, and who had been laid off in the recent downturn. But Kane was a lot cheaper, and didn't demand full-time work. People like her were a hot commodity in the free market right now. She was a worker who didn't mind getting screwed. Employers loved her. She liked the work because she didn't really have to talk to or deal with anyone. She just climbed into her seat, manipulated her ride hauling the crates and boxes, and did her thing. Years before, she had earned a good living doing similar work. Then she'd been injured on the job, and the painkillers had helped a lot, so she kept taking them. Then came the day when she couldn't stop taking them. And then it wasn't just painkillers. It was anything she could snort, swallow, or stick herself with. And there went her job and everything else. Someone had suggested counseling. She had gone to one person, but when he'd asked about any troubles in her past, she got up and left. It wasn't worth it. Kane knew if she waded back into that, she'd just slit her wrists. There was only one way for her to go, and that was forward. Some psych guy could write a book on her, but Kane would never read it. She had lived it. One ride through hell was enough. Kane had never been to prison, only in jails for short periods for stupid crap she shouldn't have done. Petty thefts, DUIs, drug possession, throwing a drunk accountant through a plate glass window for grabbing first her ass and then her breasts, only to have his buddies swear it was all her. Stuff like that. Shit happened. Shit just happened to her more than to a lot of others, it seemed. Each time she was arrested, she'd been afraid that her ID and manufactured past would not pass muster and uncomfortable questions would follow. Yet she had found that the police in real life were not quite the stuff you saw on TV. 
The computers were old and boxy. The offices drab. The clothes they wore drabber still. There wasn't an ounce of sexy among the whole crew. The morale was low, and the energy to go above and beyond on low-end cases like hers was virtually non-existent. She was one piece of dull paper in a billion. Just shuffle her through, because who really gave a crap? Thank God for that. She clocked out on the dot. She was about to get into her car when a new guy came up to her. His job was to fuel and detail the trucks, or at least she had seen him doing that. He was lean, too thin, really, with a scraggly, ill-groomed beard, twitchy eyes, and a conceited expression, at least to Kane. Hey, he said. Yeah? Hey, you don't like guys. What makes you say that? He grinned. Because you've never gone out with none of the boys here. You talking about the one guy who has teeth or all the others? Hey, that's bitchy, he said, frowning. What the hell do you care? I don't know. Look, forget it. Shit, I mean, what the hell is your problem? Kane said, I got no problem. Just here doing my job, and now I'm going to do another job. His expression changed from angry to curious. Yeah? Where is that? Why? I make chump change here. I clean offices at night. But that pays shit, too, and it ain't regular work. Look. He glanced around nervously and then lit up a cigarette. His hands were shaky. Look, I, I got me a kid, and my old lady ain't doing too good. Rehab, you know, meth. It's a bitch. She looked him over and decided his old lady wasn't the only one fighting a meth addiction. Kane saw all the signs, because she'd been there too. Detailing trucks and cleaning offices, not much future. Same goes for meth. You don't kick that, nothing else matters because it gets in your head and you can't do anything else but worry about the next pop and how to get it. Shit, I know that. So what else do you do? He asked. She looked him over. I do group lift rides three times a week in the afternoon. My car's not pretty, but it takes people who don't have a lot of dollars where they need to go. Not great money, but it's something. Then I go home and sleep. Then four nights a week, I work security, making rounds at a gated community a few miles outside of downtown. Ten to six in the morning. I'm on duty tonight, in fact. They used to have their own private police force, but then they outsourced it to save money. See, even the rich pinch pennies sometimes. It pays eight fifty an hour. No real bennies, but there's no heavy lifting. And you get a little car to drive around in. I've been doing it for six months. And the only thing that happened was I had to roust some pothead kids out of a rich dude's pool. Security job. I can't pass no background check. And if I have to pee into- She interrupted. They don't do any of that. No pee cups. No tests. At least they never have with me. They're supposed to, I guess. But the place that hired me? I went in for an interview at four in the afternoon and was on duty at ten that night. The only thing they asked me was what size uniform I took and whether I wanted a gun. They just want bodies riding around in a uniform looking like they know what they're doing. Optics, they call it. No training. Really? If they had to get people to pee or pass a background check, they might as well close up shop. No Ivy Leaguers are applying for this stuff. He took a puff on the cigarette and slowly blew the smoke out while he stared at the ground. I guess that's right. And anyway... All the homes have these fancy security systems and surveillance cameras out the ass. We're just gravy on top of the mashed potatoes. And did you want a gun? No. Why not? For eight fifty an hour? I got a gun. They got a gun. They're more likely to shoot me. I think I'd go for a gun. She looked him over. You know how to use one? Sure. How do I apply for a job? She pulled out a piece of paper and pen from her glove box, spun him around, and used his back as a desk as she wrote a phone number down. She handed it to him. Here, tell him L. Kane sent you. It might help. I know the extra cash comes in handy. After they take out taxes and crap, it's around two twenty a week. Shit, that's more than I make here. They pay me under the table, so it's less than minimum. But they feed me lunch, and there's usually some leftover donuts for breakfast. There you go. You can buy your own donuts. 
He looked at the paper and said, Thanks. I mean it, really. No problem. Hope it works out. He looked at her bruised face, apparently focusing on it for the first time. Damn, what happened there? Got in a fight. Who with? Some other chick. She ended up in the hospital to get her jaw wired and to hopefully think about something else to do with her life. I ended up going home and having a beer. He chuckled as though he thought she was kidding. But do you like guys? I like some guys some of the time. I don't like most guys most of the time. He grinned and stuffed the paper into his shirt pocket. You're not like what they said. I'm not like what anybody says, because nobody really knows me. And that's how I want it. Chapter 12. You, a rental cop. Now that's a good one. In the rearview mirror, Kane was staring at herself in a plain gray uniform with chevrons on the sleeve, signifying absolutely nothing. It was just more optics. She was perched in her tiny two-door smart car with the name Steel Security Services airbrushed on the side panels in nifty colors. There was an orange bubble light on top of the car that she would turn on from time to time, and then she'd speed around just to break up the boredom. She had the seat all the way back, but with her long legs, she still felt cramped. She had been on duty for about two hours. It was a bit after midnight. She had made several rounds over her area of responsibility and found zero cause for concern. Certainly the rich were sensibly afraid that someone would try to take what they had, but the truth was, most thieves went for easier targets, like the poor and working class, and sometimes reaching up to grab onto those in the middle of the economic pecking order. There was a gatehouse on the only road into the community, and it was manned by an armed guard 24-7. There were also two cars patrolling the neighborhood during the night, one of which was hers. The homes had all the latest gizmos and security, with more cameras than a Hollywood backlot. All in all, this was one tough nut for someone to crack. You made a 911 call from here, the real and rental cops would show up before you put down the phone. Someone had broken into an apartment she'd had once in Detroit, in an area that could have been generously called in transition. She called 911, but the cops hadn't even bothered to come. They were probably scared to. She started on another round through the subdivision. And even though she'd seen them many times before, Kane found herself still marveling at the size of the homes, or estates, that were located here. They looked like mini hotels. They all had landscaped grounds, lavish in-ground pools, guest houses, and elaborate statuary, with each owner clearly trying to outdo his neighbor, if the amount of remodeling and new construction work being done was any indication. But hey, you had to do something with the cash. She had no idea what the homeowners did to earn enough to live in places like this, but she knew she would never be among their number. And she was okay with that. She didn't want to live in a place so big that she might get lost. Later, she pulled off the road, had a cup of lukewarm coffee poured from her thermos, and pecked in notes on the iPad the security firm gave her to use. The observations were perfunctory, and were really only meant to show that she was actually doing something. She seriously doubted anyone read them, and if they did, it was a massive waste of time. Nearly hit squirrel, heard dog bark, saw rich white girls sneak out and jump into clunker hatchback with poor brown boy and they drove off. Saw a drunk homeowner pawing equally drunk woman half his age and not his wife as they stumbled into house, getting naked along the way. Same old crap. Kane turned on the radio, drank her coffee, and scrolled through her phone. Amazing things, these phones. When she'd first learned of the internet, it had blown her away. That was some seriously cool shit. There was so much she didn't know that she had had to prioritize and focus on the things she needed in order to get by. That was it. All the rest, she just winged it. Kane wanted to smoke some weed for the chronic pain she suffered from, but that would get her fired if her employer somehow found out. 
and she couldn't afford to blow such a cushy job. She doubted after her last fight, and bust up with Sam, that she would be getting any cage matches for a while. Besides her rotator issue, one doctor had told her she had an irregular heartbeat. She should be on meds for it, but meds were for people with insurance. She also needed some dental work done, and she had to take care of a few other medical issues too. But without health coverage, you just had to deal with it until you had the cash. She had already spent pretty much all her savings on having an old back injury remedied. She'd refused to put it on her plastic. Not that her credit limit would have been enough. She'd asked the surgeon if she really needed to do it. He had told her, not if you don't care about being in a wheelchair in five years. When she got really sick, she went to the emergency room. They did what they did, then billed her a shitload of money that she couldn't and didn't pay. It is what it is, I guess. The Atkinses had not believed in doctor and dentist visits, at least for her. The first time Kane had seen either was when she had been on her own for two years. Three rotted teeth had come out of her mouth, and two implants had gone in. And a month later, she'd had surgeries for a hernia, a torn muscle, and a broken arm that dated back to when she was 10 and had never gotten proper medical attention. The dentist, GP, and surgeon, respectively, had quizzed her as to why her parents had not addressed these issues before then. She had lied and told them her parents were dead, and she'd been raised by her grandmother, who was not quite right in the head. They had all let that pass, which was good, since she didn't have a backup lie at the time. She'd since gotten much better with her web of fabrications. The dentist, GP, surgeon, and hospital had then sued her for the unpaid bills because her checks bounced like basketballs. She had skipped town, which was the only thing she could think to do at the time. She looked down at her left foot and quickly wriggled it as the pain shot through. The copperhead had bitten her there when she was 13, while she'd been picking up wood from a stack to carry into the house. Her damn foot had swelled up, the venom started eating her skin away, and a serious infection had set in. Desiree had poured what she called magic water over it, and spoke some gibberish Kane couldn't understand, and she doubted Desiree could either. Three weeks later, Kane had come out of a coma, a term she had learned about later. Wanda had been there when she came to. Wanda apparently had some medical training. Kane's foot had been heavily bandaged, and there were some bottles of medicine next to her bed. The dressing smelled strongly of what she now knew was antiseptic. The skin on her foot would never look the same. But she didn't care. Kane had lived. What more could she hope for? These musings abruptly stopped when Kane heard the announcer on the radio. Rebecca Atkins. The FBI was looking for a Rebecca Atkins from Georgia in connection with a matter from the early 2000s. Anyone with information about her was to call the number provided by the FBI, and there was also an email address provided. When she had been held captive all those years, a cold dread would come over Kane whenever she heard the footsteps coming closer. This was when she was younger and unable to defend herself. What would happen when the door opened? What was Desiree's mood? Cruel? Batshit? Drunk and docile? or doped up and mean? Was Joe going to be regular Joe, or monster Joe? How bad would it hurt? Would she cry? It was a feeling like your stomach had turned in on itself, that your blood had solidified, and where your hearing became so acute, you could hear grass bending into the wind at a 100 yards. Your entire world was condensed to the shape of a door with your heart pounding at the thought of what would come through it. The monster of every fairy tale nightmare. Only this monster lived in the house with her. She hadn't felt the freezies, as she had called them, since she had turned 15. When she had grown to her full height and was as strong as a horse, the comings of the Atkinses no longer terrified her. After that, she had terrified them. But she still had been a prisoner. Now the debilitating freezies were settling in all over her body. 
the FBI was looking for her about an incident in Georgia from the early 2000s. There could only be one incident involving Rebecca Atkins from Georgia during that time. She took out her joint and lit up, sucking the smoke into her lungs like these were the last pops of weed she would ever take. The PSA ended, and the radio channel went on to something else. But for Kane, there was no going on to something else. Headlights suddenly slammed against her windshield like a wave of water. When she saw it was her colleague in the other steel security clown car, she lowered the joint out of sight, but did not roll down the window, though he opened his. She held her phone up to her ear as though she were on a call. He smiled, nodded in understanding, and drove on. For the next six hours, Kane drove around and around like she was on some giant carousel that didn't have an off button. But she wasn't seeing any of the houses, or a random car or person, even though they were all there. All she could think was, the FBI was looking for her in connection with an incident. Her shift ended, and she aired out the car before dropping it off and getting back into her ride in the steel security parking lot. She had a sudden thought and used her phone to go online and Google FBI and Rebecca Atkins. This took her to the FBI's official website and caused her another shock as a fuzzy still photo came up on the screen. It was her, after she had just burst through that door on her way to freedom. I, I look batshit. And I probably was. No, I definitely was. But I was also cunning. I was focused in my total madness. I just wanted out. Who wouldn't have? She looked in the mirror again, and then stared at the image on her phone screen. She breathed a sigh of relief. There was no way anyone would think those were the same person. Her hair was long. Her face was thinner and drawn and filthy. She looked like a lifetime member of some insane asylum. While she didn't necessarily look normal now, she didn't look like that anymore either. Kane sat back and thought about those first few months of freedom. She had hitchhiked across the country, putting as much space between her and Georgia as she could, finally stopping at the Pacific Ocean, which she didn't even know was called that. She didn't even know how many states there were. She didn't know what California was. It had taken her years to build up even a semblance of basic knowledge. I had to teach myself to drive a car, take medicine, and read something other than picture books, though the librarians over the years had helped me a lot with that. I had to learn how to write my name in something other than block letters, to add and subtract. Hell, what was a credit card? Or a rent payment? Or an email? Or a smartphone? Or a computer and the internet? Or a million other things that everyone else took for granted but I never could? She leaned her head into the steering wheel. You've overcome so much, Elle. Think about that. She drove home to get ready to go to work. She would sleep later, after her forklift gig. She would bag working out and being a cheap chauffeur today. She didn't like people looking for her. She didn't want to be found. Only bad things could happen from that. And having enough bad things already happened to me. Well, apparently not. Chapter 13 Son of a bitch. Kane had returned to her home to find that the padlock she used had been removed and another put in its place. And her clothes, books, and other possessions had been tossed on the ground right outside her residential pod. That included her beer and what little food she had up there, and that was now rotted and also torn up by animals. Tacked on the wall next to the lock, was an official-looking notice proclaiming that any trespassers would be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Still in there, under the floorboard, was all her cash, her stash of pot, and her Glock. Assholes, the voice said. She turned to see the elderly man walking up to her. He was too thin, too shaky, and he looked ready to drop dead at her feet. He was also her neighbor and a good kind person. 
What in the hell happened, Saul? She asked. They came last night, Al. Tossed all my stuff out along with me. Ruined my only good pair of pants and all my bottles of insurer for shit. And that costs a pretty penny, assholes. He spat on the ground. Who are they? Said they were hired by the folks that just bought this place. Some people on the West Coast, they said. Plan to turn it into luxury condos or some such. But my rent's paid through the end of the month. So's mine. I told them fellers that. They told me it wasn't their problem. I could go to court and sue. Right, like we can afford to hire lawyers. But I still got stuff in there. I don't know what to tell you, Al. They threw my ass out last night around midnight. Scared the shit out of me. Just cut my lock clean in two. They'd done it to everybody here. Had the cops with them, just in case. Cops? But how can they evict people if they've paid their rent? I thought there were laws. Hell, laws are for the rich folks. You think anybody gives a shit about us? And when I tried to argue the point, one of them said the rent money we supposedly paid wasn't that we were illegally squatting. That's bullshit. What else did these guys tell you? Told me if I come back, they'd toss me in the can. But you are back. Hell, I never went away. I slept next to the dumpster. Where are these guys now? I think they're coming back tonight. They said something about fencing in the whole kit and caboodle then. What are you gonna do now? This was the only place I could afford. Just got my social security and whatever I can earn. Guess I'll check out one of the homeless shelters. But last time I did, they was full up. And they got some mean suckers in there. Do stuff to you. Take your things, what little you got. I'll probably go to the underpass. Or maybe down by the river. They got a little shanty town there. At least till I find something else. Well, good luck. He tottered off to move on with his life. She had to admire his pluck in the face of losing basically everything he had. Kane picked up all her things and carried them to her car. She returned to the building and looked at the padlocked door. She was calculating how best to do this. Hey! She turned to see the man striding toward her. He was in his 30s, about her height, around 200 muscular pounds. His blunt expression was as serious as a man about to go to war. He had a holstered pistol and wore the uniform of a private security service. Hey, right back, said Kane. He stopped cold when he saw her uniform. Who are you? Who the hell are you? Dwight Talbot. I'm on duty here to secure this place. Well, so am I. Name's Donna White. I just got called up to come here. And that's after pulling a graveyard shift. He looked at the logo and name on her uniform. Steel Security? I used to work for them. They'd lowball the guards. Tell me about it. When did you make the switch to Douglas? She said, noting the name and logo embroidered on his sleeve. About six months ago. Smart man. I might do the same. I didn't know Steele was on this job, too. I just go where I'm told. You know how it is. Yeah, I damn well do. West Coaster's putting up luxury condos here, so I heard, she said smoothly. Hell, I was wondering what they were doing with this pile of crap. When I was a kid, they made furniture here. At least I think. Well, we'll never be able to afford to live here. I don't have luxury in my future. Me too. That's the damn truth. Look, said Kane. I know they cleared everybody out last night, but have they checked out all these buildings? Dunno. Why? Because when I got here, I could have sworn I heard somebody inside this one. Shit, really? Yeah, but the door is padlocked. You want to call the cops? Although, if I'm wrong, we might get our asses handed to us. But if I'm right, and we score the prick ourselves. We might cop a bonus, said Talbot. What I'm thinking. How do you want to do this? You got a key for the lock. I was supposed to get a copy, but in all the rush, they never got it to me. Talbot pulled out a key on a large ring from his pocket. This is a master. Fits all the ones they put on last night. Cool. Okay, hand it over. I'll pop the lock and let's go in. You got the gun, so you cover my back, okay? Okay. 
He passed her the key and took out his pistol. Just don't shoot me by accident, Dwight. He grinned. Hell, Donna, that ain't gonna happen, hon. Just checking. She unlocked the door, and they quietly made their way inside and up a short flight of steps. The interior was tiny, with only two doors. Kane knew one led to her bedroom and the other to the bathroom. You check that door, she said, pointing to the bathroom door. I'll do the other. You sure you want to split up? Said Dwight. You don't have a gun. She slid out her baton. I got this, and a do MMA. For shit, really? Yeah, just won a match the other night. Well, you look like you can take care of yourself, that's for sure. Just holler if you need me, hon. He went left, and Kane entered her room on the right. She eyed the floorboard and thought quickly. She opened the window and then stepped back. Hey, Dwight, come quick, she called out. Talbot bolted into the room. There was nobody in the bathroom, he said. What's up? Kane pointed at the window. Just saw the asshole running into the woods behind here. He must have gotten in and then out through this window when he heard us coming. You look faster than me. Go after him and I'll call this in. Right, I'll get the son of a bitch. Talbot bolted outside. As soon as Kane heard the door bang open, she lifted up the floorboard, took out her cash, gun, and pot, put the board back, and ran down the stairs and out the door. She put all her stuff in her car and was back at the building when Talbot came huffing back. He, he must have got away, said Talbot, bending over and sucking in air. You, you call it in? Been trying. Damn cell phones got no bars. You're gonna have to do it. Oh, okay. He straightened and made the call. When he was done, Kane looked down at her phone. Hell, now I get a call coming in? I hate AT&T. She put it to her ear. Yeah. What? Yeah, this is Donna White. You're shitting me, right? No, really, you're shitting me. Okay, well, screw you too. She put the phone away in her pocket with a disgusted look on her face. What was that all about? Dwight asked anxiously. Steele just canned my ass. And you want to know why? Because they saw on the film from last night that I dozed off for like 10 seconds. Like no rental cops ever done that. Sorry asses, exclaimed Talbot. So they just told me to get my butt back and turn in all my stuff. Yeah, I'll turn it in. I'll throw it in a fucking dumpster. What I would do, no lie, hon, said Talbot. Well, hang in there, Dwight. Don't let them screw with you. Okay, Donna. Hey, sorry, gal. Yeah, everybody's got problems, but I'm still breathing, right? And look, don't even mention I was here to anybody, okay? They'll probably try to pull some bullshit about something that happened so they can screw me out of my last paycheck. Hey, my lips are zipped. She fist bumped him, went to her car, climbed in, and drove off. Oh, Dwight, what a dumbass you are. And thank you for that, hun. She settled her gaze on the road. Now she just had to find a new place to live. And she still had the little matter of the FBI looking for her. She needed to do something about that. Only what? Chapter 14 Atley Pine and Carol Blum pulled into Huntsville, Alabama. Located in the Tennessee River Valley, it was a stately, historic southern town with a growing population and a modern veneer over the aged antebellum underbelly. It had rich parts, poor parts, and in-between parts, just like every other town. Its economy had moved from cotton mills to textile plants to the space program, and now centered on biotechnology. It was an interesting mix of old and new. Storied families with long lineages and old, sprawling homes with pillars out front and water views out back, facing a wave of diverse newcomers coming for good-paying jobs, interesting work, and cheaper housing than could be found in the Northeast, California, Florida, or Texas. After skirting the downtown area and driving for a while, they pulled into the gravel drive of a one-story brick and siding rancher. It covered about 1,200 square feet in a neighborhood of 70s-era homes that had probably cycled through several generations of families, 
and would probably cycle through several more before all was said and done. Pine knocked on a door that had peeling paint and a tarnished and dented brass footplate. A few moments later, they heard a woman's raspy voice through the closed door. Yes? Mrs. Atkins? Yes? The voice was now both worried and intrigued. I'm with the FBI. I'd like to talk to you. The FBI. Is this some sort of joke? No, it's not. Pine took out her shield and placed it against the dirty side light next to the door. She could see a woman's blurred, wrinkled face studying the FBI badge through the glass. Okay, what is this about? Your son, Joe Atkins. Joe? He's long since dead. I know, that's what we want to talk to you about. Please, it's important. They could hear the lock being turned back and the door slowly opened. Wanda Atkins was nearly 80 now, shriveled and withered by the years into something both hard and soft. She had on khaki pants and a white blouse and wore thick white orthopedic shoes that looked as though they weighed about two pounds each. She was also using a metal cane with a curved handle and a wide bottom for support. Her hair had been permed beyond all reasonable recovery, with tufts missing and revealing pink scalp underneath. Her face was a mass of embedded concentric lines, and her eyes were set deep in the shrunken hollows of the sockets. Still, they were youngish eyes paired with the tanned skin and bedlam of wrinkles. The effect was a bit unnerving, like Pine was watching the woman age right in front of her. She had a cannula in her nose, and a long oxygen line connected to it went down to the floor and then out of sight into the house. Now what is this about Joe? May we come in? Asked Pine. Atkins glanced at Blum, who said, We're just here for information, Mrs. Atkins. Perhaps comforted by Blum's age and innocuous appearance, Atkins stepped back so they could move into the house. They were immediately hit by mingled odors of bleach, mustiness, and fried foods. You'll have to excuse me. I have to give Lynn his medication, said Atkins, moving past them. He needs them right on time. They followed her into the next room. The house was cluttered with cardboard boxes stacked up and piles of unread, folded newspapers and magazines, and what looked to be insurance and medical papers. Dust had accumulated on every surface that Pine could see. Two large oxygen tanks sat in holders against one wall, along with a portable oxygen concentrator that was connected to the line attached to Atkins's cannula. There were also boxes of tubing and what looked to be a CPAP machine on a table. Two aluminum walkers were perched against a wall. A blood pressure monitor hung on a stand, and a gurney with collapsible sides was set against another wall. Prescription bottles lined one table and sat next to an elongated pill dispenser organized by days of the week. The dispenser's bins were chock full of pills. It looked like an ICU room in the suburbs. Strapped into a wheelchair was, Pine assumed, Len Atkins. His bald head and withered body listed to one side. His tongue was hanging out, and he was drooling onto a bib tied around his neck. He looked like the roughened shell of a human being nearing its expiration date. Atkins poured some liquid from a brown bottle into a small measuring cup, eyeing the dosage carefully, and then poured that into a glass of water. She then placed a straw in the glass. Lynn, it's time, sweetie. You need to drink this. Len perked up a bit, his gaze running around the room until it found his wife standing right in front of him. She put the straw in his mouth, and he started to suck on it. It took about a minute, but he got the liquid down. She wiped his mouth and put the glass down. She turned to them and said in a very low voice, he had a stroke last year. The doctors say this is as good as he's going to be. He can't walk or talk or do much of anything else, really. I think he can understand most things. We have an aide that comes in four times a week. But on days she's not here, it's tough. Most times I get the lady next door to help. 
she's in her thirties and very strong. And I'm not without disabilities either. She glanced at the oxygen tank. I have pretty bad COPD. Please, God, never pick up a cigarette. It's not pretty. And I'm ashamed to say I still can't kick the nicotine habit. But what the hell does it matter now? Pine said, well, with all this oxygen around, it might matter a lot if some of it leaks. That's why I vape. No need for matches. We can leave Lynn here if you want and talk in the kitchen about Joe. You said he can understand things, said Pine. Yes. Then if you don't mind, I'd prefer that he listen in. Atkins stiffened at this remark, but raised no objection.